Yeah, stay warm and conserve energy. Now normally, if a runner's in trouble, because they've got, they're wearing so little and they've got so little with them, I um, find all the case histories, they kept moving and quite often quite miraculously survived. But a lot of them, when they have got out, have been that bloody close to falling over. If you're immobilised, you break a leg or something, and you can't get out, you've got to conserve energy as much as you can. You get into your bag, you reach out and you break off branches, or if you've got a pocket knife, you cut off grass, ferns, things like that. You build insulation under you to stop losing heat to the ground. If, there's dry, if you can drag yourself to dry stuff nearby, you stick that in your bag to give you extra insulation, make an artificial, if rather scratchy, sleeping bag and you conserve energy. Is there any case of in the If you're in a survival situation, who cares what's going to happen in three weeks' time? Drink the water. But it's generally good in the Tarot, I don't... I don't treat the creek water from the Tarot's. I've never had Giardia. I drink it. I won't drink water that's from a farm source, so I'm, I'm always checking my map to see where the water's coming from, but you drink the water. And even if there's a chance of getting Giardia, that's three weeks away. The important thing is to survive to enjoy the weight loss later. <laughs> but six pills, go to your doctor, six pills and it's cured. The problem is recognising that that's what the problem is. Okay. Who carries what spare sustenance with them? What do you carry? Spare sustenance. Yeah. Oh, that sounds that sounds good. You've got to use a bit of common sense, but you should have some spare sustenance with you in case things go wrong. In there, I have a couple of cheap muesli bars. I look for the ones that have got the most oats in them. But unfortunately, muesli bars these days have become confectionery. So they're not as, the, the cheap ones used to be quite good, but they're now just about mainly sugar. The old days they used to say carry barley sugars. And I'd say that's the last thing you want. Why? Yep, sugar high, sugar low. You've got to keep eating them. Chocolate's far better. Simple sugars get to you straight away. More complex sugars, a bit longer. Fats, which will burn for ages. And protein, which will burn for ages. Chocolate is wonderful. I don't take it as an emergency food, because I like it too much. It's never there when I need it. But just think about it, what you're carrying, and could it get you through tonight if you can't get out today? And as for survival, Henry Ford had a great saying. If you think you can, or you think you can't, you're probably right.
Does that make sense? All the epic tales of survival that I believe are built around a person's accepting the situation and believing they can survive. They're not always right, but they're nearly always right. And this was brought home to me by around the campfire chat a few years back with a quite a serious ex-army um, hunter come outdoor instructor. And he said, we were talking about hypothermia, and he said, why don't hunters die of hypothermia? Everybody's... No, but, you know, when we thought back, we had quite a few tramper deaths of hypothermia we could think of, but we couldn't think of any hunters. And he says, there's two reasons. He says, number one, they don't hesitate to go into the bush. So they're getting out of what? They're getting out of the wind. He says, number two, they're too thick to know when they're beaten. Which coming from an avid hunter like him, I thought was a great statement. Too thick to know when they're beaten. They don't give up. And they probably never heard of what Henry Ford said. Any questions? You spoke about a guy who, who carried in 500 grams of rice. Yes. Is that a reasonable thing? You know, it didn't last a long time. It didn't mean enough to leave in the bucket you think. No, he had a marriage upset, grabbed a 500 gram packet of rice, his pack, his rifle, his boots, jumped in his van, disappeared. And a week later when he hadn't come home, his wife called the police here in Wellington. They found his van at the Maymorn Junction. They searched for three weeks. They couldn't find him, they gave up. Two weeks later, some trampers who were slightly geographically embarrassed coming down a creek off their planned route came across him. One ran out, called for help, luckily I was on duty and so we were able to speed things up a bit and Peter Button flew in and pulled him out for us. One of Peter's last rescues before he met the power lines. But that guy was starving. He thought the Westpac rescue chopper had come to shoot him. He was delirious with hunger. But yeah, he wasn't being reasonable. He was all upset. He'd recently converted to Buddhism and he'd gone to meditate. He'd lost his boots, he'd lost his sleeping bag, he'd lost his rifle. He was a very lucky guy that, I think they were actually Vic Uni camping club people, had made a wrong turn. Otherwise, we'd have probably found his body. Some hunter would have found it because it's an area that's quite popular in April. If your movement is impaired, like you've wrecked a leg or something, um, you definitely need, rather than risk further injury and keep moving, that's when you stop, conserve energy and warmth and um, wait for help. If you're totally lost, if you've got no, absolutely no idea where you are, that's when you should start saving energy too. 
because if you keep moving then you might be moving yourself further into trouble if you've gone off your advised route um, you're just going to make the search area more difficult so that's another time but if you think you can if you've got a rough rough idea where you be where you are um, by all means self-rescue and uh, I always used to have a policy as a police search controller when I was in the police I'd look at it unless there were imperative factors to go straight in most runners and mountain bikers I usually gave them to nine o'clock the next day particularly if they weren't alone now yeah, was there another question would you if you are completely lost should you try and get to a ridge or should you try and get to water if you can hear water you need water and you need shelter so not and there's very little shelter on ridges. If there's a ridge nearby, by all means go up there, tie a knot in the tussocks, or make, make an arrow with sticks pointing to where you're gone. Yeah. But don't stay on the ridge, please. Yeah. It makes it easier to find your body, but we'd rather find you alive in the bush. No. And Especially in the Western Tararua's, I've, I've got a reputation to protect, so please stay alive. I've got a good ratio. How often is this darkness factor of people getting lost? Fairly often. Usually blokes, usually biting off more than they can chew and don't make it back in time. And in the gathering darkness they take a wrong turn. Mountain bikers, trampers and runners. But not often women, it's usually the blokes that try and bite off more than they can chew. <laughs> what, are the, um, what are the main, after all these rescues over the years, what are the main, the main patterns or the main things that you could give advice to, like the key things that pe mistakes people make? Is there any major ones that keep coming up or are they a variety? Like, is there any best tips? From uh, Clint Eastwood, Dirty Harry, Magnum Force. Film that was uh, made before a lot of people here were born. But it has two memorable lines. Everybody remembers one at the beginning. Where he's got his great big 44 Magnum out and he's pointing it at a guy trying to do a robbery and says, Go ahead, make my day, punk. Everybody remembers that. But the important line is right near the end of that film. And that is, a good man always knows his limitations. As I said, most of the mountain bikers and runners have been caught by darkness. It's been because they've bitten off more than they could chew. Oh yeah. I can do that. I can go all that way. No trouble. And they don't look carefully. And it's a male characteristic. It's well researched in out, outdoor um, activities and science. Blokes, we're this good. But we think we're this good. So when you're planning, when you're looking at it, just get a female to double check your plan. <laughs> because while they're this good, they think they're about this good. And if you don't believe me, ask anyone in the car insurance industry. Just the way we are. And if you do have a problem, do it in the Western Tararua's. There's no episodes of the missing in my patch. Hmm? Uh, um, so if someone's been lost, what's the, the general time frame between them staying put and when someone's found them? 
like assuming you left notice that you should be somewhere and you're not not there what's generally the time they can be expected to be sitting in the bush going when are they going to get to me kind of time frame they vary but from the time that they're reported we've usually got them within 30 hours quite fast. Hmm. Key thing, always leave an intention of where you're going and if you're not Yep. You get if you if you leave your intentions, you stay with your intentions. Unless your life depends on it. If your intentions were to cross the Waitaru River and you get to it, it's bank to bank and brown and roaring and you can hear the clonk 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 of rocks rolling in it. Well, then I'd say it's reasonable to break your intentions and take the long way back. But the search and rescue would go, this is probably, they'd follow your attempt, your, where your specified route, and then they'd work out what's probably happened. So generally, if things go to, to custard and you've sort of given your notice and you're going, right, I'm lost, and you sit tight, you, on average, you'll be there within yeah, a couple of days or something, yeah. 30 hours. Yeah. It's quite good and, to know, the peace of mind. Yeah. And like there was um, one couple went wrong on Monday night. But they weren't due out till Friday night. And there was father and daughter. He was 60, she was 31. They were on the side of a basically a cliff in the middle of the Tararuas, no way to climb out, no way to climb down and he just, she got quite agitated, he just worked on the little shelf they were on till it was big enough to put the tent up, they had a trickle of water nearby and he just kept saying to her we're here till Sunday. And she'd get up after a while she'd get fidgety and agitated and he'd say no we're here till Sunday we won't be there Friday night mum will report us police will give us a bit of time to get out we're not out Saturday night they'll come looking for us they'll find us Sunday and he just calmly said that all week and she was saying at the debrief she just couldn't understand he, he's so calm <laughs> He just kept saying, they'll find us on Sunday. He was wrong. We got him Saturday afternoon. Was, um, that was a classic search situation where we were able to eliminate a whole lot of stuff straight away. And we knew dock guys had been at a hut halfway along the circuit, contacted them. They hadn't seen these two. They would have seen them. Bingo, search narrows down. Other dock guys have been working on another hut. Yeah, we did see them. Search narrows down. And uh, I tracked them all day. And I was about two hours from them. Afternoon tea time. And they sent a bloody helicopter to have a look. And found them before we got there. But yeah, it was well and truly worth it, but the inspiration there was how calm that guy stayed. He, he, they had the necessities of life in that they had shelter and they had water. And it was just a matter of staying calm and waiting. And that's what he did. He knew they were going to be fine, they just had to wait till Sunday. Any source of light is good, but if they're looking for you in the dark, they're going to be using night vision goggles. And night vision goggles work at the red end of the spectrum. We did some tests with the Air Force in 2008. 
um, your standard LED torch is at the blue end of the spectrum. It does show, but it's not brilliant. A match looks like a bomb's gone off. A fire is at the red end. And there was a couple benighted on a ridge behind Levin one night, but they had cell phone coverage. They called for help. While they were waiting, they lit a fire that they said was the size of a dinner plate. Eight kilometres away, the helicopter pilot saw that fire. Hovering over the site, the crewman looking out the door could not see it from straight above. But the pilot could see it plain as day. So fire, yeah, anything at the red end of the spectrum. If you're going to carry one of those glow sticks, carry a red one. So if anybody get to it, it's a red LED mode. It has a shine. It's what is that? Something weird to do with LEDs, but still trigger blue. No, um, red LEDs show up better. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, light fire is wonderful. And the other thing about fire is it can warm you up. It's a marvellous morale booster. So I don't believe in fires in the back country except in an emergency. But a couple of times I've been with groups of young people who've had a really long, cold, hard day. I've declared an emergency and lit a fire. And they're all dragging their asses around. I light the fire. 15 minutes later, they're all happy and bouncy and cheerful. If you decided that you're going to hunt down if you're good at making fire, I'd do that first. I would put a bit of food inside because the, you've got to keep the body fueled. And if you're in a survival bag situation, yes, you put all your clothes on. Because once you stop moving, you put your clothes on to conserve the energy that's there. It's about conserving energy. If <laughs> Don't be sorry. This impossible story about three lads up in the Scottish Highlands who they found frozen to death crouched around their um, burner. <laughs> Run out of gas. Mm. Yeah. What have we got that the Scots haven't? <laughs> right, but not the right answer. They don't have bush. Yeah. Their idea of a forest is either a production plantation, which are weedy, to say the least, well, they're trying to regenerate some of their natural forest, but they've got a really hard time because they've got 70,000 deer nibbling off all the new seedlings. They don't have bush, they don't have shelter there. It's like the whole place is a ridge. I've fly camped around, Fox, uh, around Scotland, and it's very, very hard to find sheltered places. And I can very, very, very easily, based on my experience there, believe that you'd freeze to death. Especially once your burner ran out of gas. Mm. Any other questions? Sir? So, um, if I'm out running on my own, and I've got a vegan with mm. me, I can imagine there's some situations like, if I have a fall and I break a leg, it's pretty obvious to me I'm going to use the beacon because I'm not going to get out. Yeah. But do you find that you know there's people out there on their own who might end up in an emergency situation, but it's a bit of a grey area and they don't really know whether you know when when it is okay to use that beacon and, and get the troops out. Hmm. And I, you know, I can imagine there might be some, some difficult situations where I'm not really sure and do I actually push that button or maybe do I wait it out and try again tomorrow or 
when is it okay to actually raise the alarm? Is there any tips on judgment? I would say if in doubt, shout. Because people will worry about definition of an emergency. If something's gone wrong, the longer you leave it without action, the worse it is. Now you might self-recover, but if there's any doubt, hit the beacon. You know, it takes time. First they've got to get the signal in. Then they've got to do the phone, check your phone contacts and do those inquiries. Then they've got to decide what's the best response. It takes time. And if you're um, injured or you're losing heat, things aren't getting better, better to get help to you. Never known anyone to be charged for activating a beacon in the backcountry in this country. Yeah. And that, you know, we've had people with sprained ankles. There was one um, set off the beacon at 2 a.m. after they had a big long debate because they were running late. And they weren't going to make it out on time the next day. So they set their beacon off at 2 a.m. Which was a bit stupid because someone sets off a beacon at 2 a.m. it usually means something like a medical emergency. So they dispatched a chopper flying into the hills at night with night vision goggles. And that's a bit risky. And the weather wasn't all that good and that's more risky. Whereas they could have waited till the next morning and then hit it. And it would have been a lot safer. But while they got their air chewed, better to have them out. Say you sprain your ankle and you can still move, but you decide to set off your beacon and maybe you're five feet away from the heart. Is it better off to kind of stay put or make your way to the heart that is still possible? Um, once you set off your beacon, you're better to stay still. If the beacon moves, they'll sometimes presume it's an accidental activation. Mm. And um, as you move, the sort of response that they're trying to plan may change. You know, if you're on um, Kiaroa and you're 5Ks from Anderson Memorial Hut, they can fly direct to the top of Kiaroa, but by the time you get halfway there, you're under bush canopy. They can't fly into there. So it's going to muck them up. If you set off your beacon, whether it's just your survival bag or whether you get into a bit of a hollow in the tussocks, something like that, cut a bit of tussock to um, make a wee bit of a mattress, stay there. Um, where it can see the most sky works the best. If it can see north, it works better. <laughs>